I'm gonna be worried about is that I leave you with this message that you have to present the way I present. So my students, please listen. You are not gonna present in your lifetime like this. This is tons of work in one presentation. So this is not one. In fact, it is kind of maybe at least seven presentations, but I'm pushing you into more. So okay. I know Dr. Rao is also there. So. Um, we're good. Uh, we go. Okay. Just let me know. <clears throat> Record. So to make sure we're recording everything. Okay. All right. Hmm. I think it's working. Should be. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to present um, some of my research um, our department. The title um, is CCUS, Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage in Louisiana, and also uh, TTA, Temperature Transient Analysis in Reservoir Characterization. So I'm covering two different topics, and then within each topic, I'm covering completely different topics. So that's what you would, you should expect. Um, the, I would like to start with, with the technology my co-authors <coughs> for, for the material to be presented here. Refat Hashish, Ilin Mao is with ISP now, Mujtaba Musahir, Mujtaba, Nam Tran, Muhammad Zulgarnay, Oh, he's not yet. These are members of my group in alphabetic order. <coughs> um, Richard Hughes, Brian Schneider, and David Dismukes. Brian and David are with the Center of Energy Studies. So today I'm starting with the CCUS first. <coughs> Today's energy discussion, especially for fossil fuels, is undetachable from climate change. These are some of the recent headlines that I'm picking, relatively recent, uh, that shows that uh, the oil and gas industry is increasingly involved in the discussion and is willing to do something about cutting the CO2 footprint. Um, the CERA Week, which is uh, an annual uh, meeting uh, held in Houston every year, uh, is a high level meeting on the future of oil and gas industry. Uh, this year was dominated by climate change. Uh, Shell is announcing that it will cut its carbon footprint by half by 2050. Uh, Oxy is spending money in uh, removal of the CO2 uh, technologies. Um, the Oxy is also in the, in, is announcing to go carbon neutral soon. So uh, these are some headlines showing that actually we are heading in that direction. Uh, I'm taking a um, um, quote from uh, uh, Ernest Moniz, which um, talks about breakthrough technologies that are required to cut the CO2 emissions. One of them is the carbon capture utilization and storage that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Uh, the carbon capture utilization and storage is one which is actually uh, allow the continued use of uh, fossil fuels while cutting the uh, carbon emissions. <coughs> So what is it? What is the carbon capture utilization, CCUS? <clears throat> it is capturing the CO2 at the source, like a power plant, electrical plant, sorry, a chemical plant, a cement factory, steel factory, <clears throat> and then once captured, transported, and injected into deep subsurface. Um, in the deep subsurface, um, either in the saline aquifers, um, depleted oil and gas fields, coal seams, and potentially use it um, uh, with, uh, with potential utilization, for instance, to, uh, for enhance oil recovery. Uh, that's, that's the CUS, okay? Projections by IEA, the International Energy Agency, expect that 
within the next um, um, 30 years, by 2050, we will have six gigaton of CO2 to be captured and stored. Um, the shale sky scenario, which looks at portfolio of, of technologies to cut the CO2 emissions, is even, is even more, more earth numbers. It shows that within the next 30 years, we will have six gigaton only in North America. So North America alone will, will, will capture and store six gigaton. If you look at what we have today, it's almost zero. We are going to go to, in 2050, 370 megaton per year. That is more than what, uh, what Louisiana is emitting today. Louisiana is emitting 220 megaton a year right now. So think about it the industry that can be created if this is gonna go. Um, but Shell Kai scenario was looking at what, what a portfolio of, the, of technologies that are required to, to meet the requirements of the Paris Agreement, the climate agreement in Paris. Um, so these are the current commercial scale uh, CCS project worldwide. The, the large one in North America, the largest one is here in West Texas, uh, which is capturing eight megaton of CO2 from an oxy uh, gas processing plant. And the CO2 is being injected in um, by Kinder Morgan in the Permian to get um, <clears throat> for enhanced early recovery. Uh, the two that are near us, uh, the, the, these two are actually near the Gulf Coast. They are capturing CO2 from, um, um, one is capturing CO2 from power plant, uh, 1.4 megaton of CO2 per year, and the CO2 is transported 80 miles away, injected in West Ranch fields, owned by Recorp. Which is, I mean, um, can you just make that? I'm Okay, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, one point four megaton of CO two captured eighty miles away of transfer transport injected in West Ranch, owned by Hillcorp. Uh, for EOR, the other one captures uh, 1.1 uh, megaton of CO2 uh, from a, uh, a refinery, uh, Valero refinery, and, in, and, and my, it transported 100 miles, injected in uh, West Hastings, owned by Denbury, for enhanced oil recovery. You may wonder that <clears throat> we have more CO2 storage, we have more CO2 ER projects, uh, uh, including in Louisiana, why they are not there? What, what, what is the answer? Do you know why? The students? Why is it not there? Source. The source, exactly. If it is coming from a natural source, like Jackson Dome, that doesn't qualify as a CCUS, so you cannot use the incentives provided to, uh, for, for carbon capture. Uh, tax credits that are now given by 45Q law. Um, so CCUS means that the CO2 source is, is actually not natural, right? Uh, now let's look at the CO2 um, potential, the CCUS potential in Louisiana. Um, Louisiana with, uh, as I said, is with 220 megaton a year is uh, ranked fifth in the nation after much more populous uh, states uh, of uh, California and Texas uh, in terms of emissions. Most of the CO2 that is in Louisiana is coming from industrial sources, but uh, this is a big difference from the, na uh, from the national uh, sources, where uh, uh, nationally in the US, most of the point sources are coming from electrical power generation. Uh, this is a big, uh, this is a very important difference because the cost of capture when it comes to industrial, so industrial sources is between 20 to $33 uh, uh, dollars a ton. But when we, we look at the power generation, it's between 60 to $160 uh, a ton. That's a huge difference in, in price. So it makes it um, much more efficient uh, uh, for, uh, for capture in Louisiana. 
um, this, the industrial sources in Louisiana are either chemical or refinery uh, in sources, and these are the large sources, sources larger than 0.1 megaton a year. As you see, most of these sources are along the Mississippi River and um, uh, along the, uh, the chemical corridor here. Uh, so if we look at the, the sources around in the chemical corridor, and we want to match uh, them with a sink, these are the sources, right? We want now, as the core engineers, we want to look at where we can store this CO2 and, and or we can use it uh, for enhanced recovery. Um, we either look at uh, saline aquifers or hydrocarbon bearing formations. Um, these are the oil fields with, uh, depleted oil fields with larger than a million barrel of production. These are gas fields uh, depleted with larger than 10 BCF of production. And these are the pipelines that are available. Um, in the first uh, award uh, uh, funding that we got, we got from the uh, Department of Energy, we were asked to look at onshore locations of saline aquifers for storage only. And that's what we did. What we did was we identified two sources. One was an ammonia plant emitting eight megaton of CO2 per year. And the other was a Norco refinery owned by Shell uh, emitting four megaton of CO2 per year. We tried to find matches, uh, uh, match them with sinks. Those sinks, one is co-located with the Biosurel <coughs> oil field um, and one with Paradi oil field. Both are relatively uh, large oil and gas producers. So we look at aquifers at these two sites. Uh, the common features of both is that uh, is that they have multiple storage zones uh, with stack sand system, <clears throat> uh, relatively thick, sometimes up to, as you will see, a thousand feet, not continuous, of sand. Um, high porosity around 30% and high permeability between 300 to 800 millidarcy and normal hydrostatic pressure. Um, and uh, again, they produce a lot of, of oil and gas. So for Biosurel, we got uh, 40 miles square of that, and we tried to find um, the um, storage capacity of this, of the Biosurel uh, area. So at this side, we identified a thousand feet thick um, sand and shale interval, but we of course only looked at the sand capacity. Um, we did the same thing for Paradis, again, 40 miles square, and it was, it was compartmentalized, as you see here, are, are, you see the faults. Uh, we came up with these uh, storage capacities. <coughs> uh, the storage capacity for Biosurel came up to be uh, 133 megaton. <coughs> uh, which is uh, enough to, um, for 17 years of uh, the ammonia plant and 33 years of the uh, refinery. Um, of course, these are all volumetric, but we had to do more, um, more of uh, simulations, dynamic capacity also, because uh, the injectivity doesn't necessarily allow us to inject as much as we want, even if, if the volume is there. That was uh, another task. In the second uh, um, <clears throat> funding that we received from the Department of Energy, we are now asked to look at uh, offshore uh, Louisiana for uh, uh, sink and source matching. So now we are trying to uh, match these uh, sources with, with sinks uh, in offshore, Gulf of, uh, offshore Louisiana, in the Louisiana waters. Um, there is no question that there is a lot of opportunities for CO2 uh, uh, for CCS in Louisiana, but there are some challenges that my research was focused on them over these past years. Um, so with my groups, with my group help, we, we worked on these challenges. Then I'm gonna go through uh, three of them. I'm not gonna be able to go through the rest. So CO2 plume extension, containment of fault leakage and well leakage that's what I'm going to address now. Um, <clears throat> when you inject the CO2, um, 
the, the, you want to know where the CO2 is going. Um, that is important uh, for not just for you as operator, but also um, the government, the regulator. They want to know whether you are containing the CO2 within the, er the area that you are supposed to or not. So if, uh, if we look at where the CO2 sometimes go, is that for instance, this is the Sleipner project in North Sea, where the CO2 is being injected here. Um, you see, this is below uh, 1,000 meters subsea. Um, this is the injection point, but the CO2 goes, you see the footprint of the CO2 all the way up to 200 meters up. This is the result of 40 sides of data. Horizontally and laterally, this is what you see, that the CO2 is not going in a, very, a nice radial shape if the reservoir was homogeneous. It goes, in fact, uh, it follows this path, you see? So the question is, how to find where is the edge of the CO2? Where is the CO2 is heading in different directions? Um, in my group, we, we, we worked on this. We came up with a tracer test as well as a three pressure uh, transient techniques. I'm gonna share two of them, two, two pressure transient techniques here. The first, um, the first has to do with two wells. So what you do is that you have a plume, you are gonna send a pulse right here, you, ob you observe the arrival time here, and you find the, the amount that is, is between here and there. In the second one, uh, you run only a single well test, and you find the distance between that well and the edge of the plume. This is essentially what we've done. So uh, in the first one, as I said, you are sending a pulse here. So you, you have a rate, a pulse rate, like you, you, you inject a certain volume very quickly, and then you look at the arrival at, at observation points. So at observation points, you will have something like this. Your delta P versus time, at this point, for instance, it will grow and then it, it reaches peaks and then it, starts, uh, it goes down, right? This is the arrival time. Uh, for this point, this is the arrival time. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, it, that's, that's very simple approach, don't complicate it. So you just send a pulse and you look at the arrival time. So when you do this test, you only get one piece of information, which is the arrival time. So let's say that how, how, we then, how then we are supposed to use this arrival time in order to come up with the amount of CO2 that is between the, the two wells. Um, you have to have this, of course, this is the equation, eta two phase. Then um, eta two phase is a function of saturation. You plot this eta two phase versus saturation. This is independent of any measurement, I mean, in the pressure transit. Then you have the arrival time, you put it in this equation, you arrive at eta two, eta two phase. You know your eta two phase versus SG, you have your eta two phase, you can find SG. Let's see how it applies. Let's say we ran a simulation, in fact. So in this simulation, <clears throat> um, the arrival time at the well was 0.38 days. And the distance of the well was 100, almost 100 meters away from the injection well. Um, you calculate eta two phase based on this equation, you get this number for the eta two phase. Then you plug your eta two phase in this graph. I mean, you put it and you get the saturation of gas, which is 24%, which is almost the same thing that we've got uh, in the CO2 film. So that almost, between the two, between the injection well and the observation well, there was almost 24% CO2 occupied. Yeah. You can also, if you have multiple, well, if you have multiple location of observations, you can also find the extent uh, of, the, of the plume. <clears throat> This is not really necessary because if you have pressure gauges, you may not need this um, because you may be able to find the CO2 arrival without even, even looking at, uh, at these slopes. But the slopes are gonna be different, of course. You, the slopes are gonna follow the diffusivity coefficient out and inside the plume, which is certainly different. One has to do with CO2, one has to do with the brine. The second uh, test is um, a single well test to estimate the plume boundary. <coughs> Uh, in this test, you, you do either production, injection, fall off, uh, build up, 
really just do one of these here and if you run a baseline let's say that the co2 was not there what you will see is supposed to be something which is more or less a zero stop line but if you hit the co2 plume because the co2 plume has um different mobility and different stereotypity you will have a deviation and that deviation uh, from the baseline should be easy to capture. But even if you don't capture it, we came up with a way that you, you, can, you can analyze it. So basically that length, that, this length is gonna be obtained from this equation. The, this M naught is, is the value that you have before the deviation. And N values are what you are gonna get after the deviation. <clears throat> So you see that for different arrival times, you have different M and therefore you are, you are calculating different L. In order to have a unique value of L, you need this graph. So you need to plot this versus the square root of time and then line feed these two and then you find this L, the, the, the length uh, to the edge of the plume from this graph. Second topic, um, on CO2 containment because of fault leakage. <clears throat> so, the Gulf region, the geology is extensively faulted. Here I'm showing a two mile cross section of a field in, in Louisiana waters, offshore Louisiana. You see six faults within two miles. This one, shows the faulting in uh, Texas waters. So this Texas state waters is right here. This is, off, this is onshore Texas, this is offshore uh, federal. <clears throat> you see that again, we have extensive faulting. Faults are known to have the potential to leak fluid vertically. Do you have examples? Water springs, sometimes. Oil and gas seepages, what else? Falls are known to take CO2 from the source rock all the way to the reservoir rock, right? Another thing that that has to be today, but if they are over pressure, if they see over pressure, um, they may change properties. Anyway, they are, um, something for that for CO2 injection, they are of concern. So we want to know whether, um, whether the uh, fault structure allows for CO2 leakage or not. That's something that would be definitely of interest when it comes to CO2 storage, in the, at least in the Gulf Coast. But at least we have four experiments that are going in the world now that are trying to see whether faults can leak CO2 um, in the field. Um, fault structure, despite being so complex, it can be simplified or idealized using these two component model. One, one component is a fault core, the other is the fault uh, damage zone. The fault core is uh, the results of shearing is training and is filled with uh, fine materials and it's surrounded by the damage zone. Um, fault permeability for the modeling purposes can be categorized using three components. One is across fault. So if this is your fault, across fault, a long fault and up fault permeability. The across fault permeability has to do with the sand shale juxtaposition. If, you are, if your sand is juxtaposed against the shale, obviously your across fault permeability is zero. Uh, but that's not to say this is always the case. Then it is governed by the core property. If the core is sealing, and that is, we use the shale gas ratio in the oil industry. Uh, to uh, and SS, SSF to calculate that. The along fault permeability <coughs> is mostly governed by the damage zone property. So 
the size of the damage zone and the permeability of the damage zone. The permeability contracts of the damage zone is governed by um, whether we have sand or carbonate, for instance, whether we have fracture, whether we have deformation damage. It can be lower or higher than the reservoir. It really depends. Upfall permeability, in addition to these, these parameters which affect the upfall, can, it can also be affected by compaction and, it's, and also effective stress orientation and magnitude. So with that, um, we've done a lot of work on faults, of course. But here, I'm just showing one thing which I think is going to be um, very useful uh, for the industry. So we built, um, we introduced a pressure transient test that allows you to determine the across fault, a long fault, and up fault permeabilities from pressure transient. And that's the significance because in the oil industry today, if you go to the packages, for instance, that we have, uh, the software packages, we see, we look uh, at across fault permeability mostly because that's the compartmentalization that matters. So uh, how we did it, this is the literature prior to our work and uh, um, we accounted for all, the pro all these um, anisotropies uh, together. This is the outcome. So for you to understand this, you remember from basic weighted thing from the, oops, combined, good. Um, from basic efficient transient analysis, you, you may remember that if we hit a fault, which is a ceiling fault, uh, our derivative will double. You remember this? That's the, the doubling, right? So all these should be new to, to, to us, right? This is, this is what we are adding now. If we have no across fault and no up fault leakage, but we have a long fault permeability, which is different from others, then we have these other lines, other blue lines that you see here. The black ones, represent that either alpha x, it may either across fault permeability is zero or up fault permeability is zero. If both of them are non-zero, we even go to, we go to these red terms, yeah? This is the conclusion. Can we characterize the fault? Because developing the model is not necessarily easy, but it's, it's not necessarily a promise that we can uh, use that model to uniquely obtain the properties of the fault. This is, despite its complexity, is in fact very informative graph because it tells you that no matter, at least for these uh, experiments that we are doing, um, for different combinations of alpha Z, alpha X, and alpha Y, we are arriving at different graphs. If so, this means that we may be able to uniquely obtain these properties from the pressure because there is no two combinations which gave the same graph, right? That's the, that's the point, that's the message. So, uh, the way we do it, in fact, we find that if you want to find alpha y, the alarm fault permeability, look at early time deviation. And if you want to find alpha x, look at late time deviation. If you want to, alpha, uh, you want to find alpha z, look at the middle time. You can also use this uh, for risk assessment. Uh, if you want to use Monte Carlo simulation to run, to run thousands of cases where you have different alpha X and alpha Y and alpha Z um, to come up with the rate, you have to be able to use the model. However, there is a problem on our side so far, which is uh, the code is very slow. Yeah? So we need to address that. Okay, but uh, that is something that the Department of Energy is actively trying to in, uh, put into their uh, uh, in, in RAF tools. Uh, anyway, third one is well leakage. Um, first thing that we did on well leakage, oh, first, well leaks, my friends. They can leak, right? These are potential pathways that allow for leakage of, um, uh, of leakage through the fall, uh, through the well, right? Uh, here is a leaky well. 
you can go visit in Utah. It's a tourist attraction. <laughs> okay. So once in a while, it, it erupts uh, CO2. Um, how do we uh, find the well? Because well leakage is not necessarily Yeah, well leakage uh, need to be first identified from whether we have well leakage, fault leakage, or gap water leakage. That's what we did first. So we looked at the above zone pressures and um, based on the flow regimes associated with well leakage, fault leakage, and cap rock leakage, we tried to find the, uh, if you have a well, if you have a fault, what is your flow regime? If you have a horizontal well, what is your flow regime? Mm -hmm. Because I'm seeing you getting sleepy, so I have to ask questions. <laughs> okay, so I need to wake you up. Um, when you have a radial, when you have a fully penetrating vertical well, what is the flow regime? But what is the flow regime? Is it radial, spherical, uh, linear? What is it? Radial, excellent. That's what I'm looking for. So if you have a well leaking into an above zone, what is going to be the flow regime? It's going to be radial, isn't it? How about, how about if you have a plane, like a fault, then the flow regime is going to be linear. linear. How about if you have a leaky cap rock? I mean, the, there is a regional weakness in your cap rock that is allowing for leakage. Fluid. It's going to be spherical. Why so? Because near the well bore, near, near the injection point, you have maximum leakage. As you go far from the well bore, you have less and less leakage. That's, that's what? Spherical. You can observe it in simulations. You can run the simulation and observe that this is in fact the case. So all you need to do is identify that flow regime in order to determine what is actually being leaked. That's what we did. We find that fault leakage gives you linear flow, radial flow for well leakage, and spherical flow for the, uh, the cap. cap rock. Next, once you identify the well leakage, you need to find where is, where is it located and what is its properties. This is what we do in order to locate it. Um, we actually use uh, this graphical technique again. Uh, we came up with a modified pressure ratio um, versus time, a semi log graph that you need to line feed at late time and you come up with the location properties as well as um, in this case now you, you find also the, the leakage rate. So I'm done with the first topic. Now I need to start the second one. Okay. Okay. So TTA uh, in reservoir characterization. <clears throat> um, the motivation here is that spatial and temporal variation of temperature along a well bore is increasingly becoming available thanks to deployment, increased deployment of, uh, of fiber optic tools in, uh, in our wells. Um, However, most of the analysis that is being done is qualitative in nature. They visualize the data and try to get information from them. Um, our focus was trying to get quantitative tools, basically quick, analytical based, um, mostly gra graphical techniques that can give you some quantitative information. Um, we looked at different data during production, injection, stimulation, and shock in periods during them. And I'm going to go only through one part of it. But in all of these cases, we solved the energy balance equation. So you remember the pressure transient had two terms, right? Which two terms? This term, accumulation term, and diffusion term for conduction, huh? that was for pressure. For temperature, you see that we have additional terms, right? That complicates the solution, of course, but 
it's also proved to be very useful. Because some of these terms um, disappear during different um, operations. This means that our analysis, whether we do injection or production, is going to be completely different. This is not the case when we do pressure. When we do pressure transient, we do analyze the fall off test the same way that we do analyze the build up test. Why? Because the equation is you have the same two terms. But when you do injection versus production, you do not solve considering the base the same ser the same terms in the equation. Yeah? That's the difference. So the solutions during injection and production are different. Uh, what is the implication of this? Well, I'm going to go through these, but um, it's not so, uh, so easy to, to give you uh, the immediate uh, differences between these. But let me tell you that during production, we've done a lot of work. And uh, during production, we came up with, uh, we solved for both drawdown and build up, and uh, we came up with graphical inversion techniques to estimate permeability, porosity, skin factor, damage zone, radius, damage zone, permeability, um, and also production profiling in multi-area reservoirs. Uh, we solved both considering infinite acting radial flow as well as boundary dominated flow, and we also considered the, uh, the fluid um, properties variation as well as um, rate and pressure variations. But that's not something that I kind of, I'm gonna cover today. Uh, I'm gonna cover what we've, what we've been doing over the past year. So our focus shifted on injection uh, in this last year. So what we've done was, uh, for instance, let's consider a water flood where we are injecting cooler fluid, uh, cooler water into these two layers. Uh, layer one has higher permeability than layer two. So once you inject water in it and you plot the temperature versus time, you should see something like this because once you inject, uh, layer one will admit more fluids compared to layer two, higher, uh, higher, higher uh, uh, permeability. Uh, but if you measure the temperature along the well bore at the sand face of these two layers, you should arrive at, you should get the same temperature, which is the injection temperature during the injection period. How about the following period? What will happen next? If I shot in, what would happen? What would happen for the temperature here? I go down, I go up. I go up, it won't burn back. Why? Because the unswept region, the, uh, the, uh, the surrounding <clears throat> will start to warm up this, right? You start warming up this uh, temperature. So the layer that admitted less fluid will have a quicker uh, rate of warm back right, than a layer which accepted this fluid. Then a layer which accepted, accepted more fluid, right? A layer which accepted more fluid will, uh, will have slower warm back. So that's what we are looking for. That's what we're looking at. Um, we look during the warm back, we try to analyze this and come up with the injectivity uh, or the injection profile, what if we have injection of 100 barrels a day of water, how, many, how, how much of it goes here and how much of it goes here? That's the question. So we started with solving this equation again. During both um, injection and shot-in period, we neglected the barothermal effects, meaning the Jude Thompson and uh, adiabatic, as well as um, the heat exchange with the surrounding. Also, we, uh, we neglected the heat advection during the shot-in period. Uh, when we solved it for one layer, we came up with this solution. This, this is the well temperature, the, the, the temperature at the sand phase of the layer, which is equal to the injection temperature plus, is a function of the Horner time ratio. Yeah, you've seen this from pressure transient analysis. And beta is the exponent, which is, function of the rate per layer. I'm solving for one layer now, though. If you take the derivative of this, 
um, you see this um, equation. Uh, of course, now it doesn't say much, but when you plot these data on this graph, where you have the log derivative as well as time difference, uh, temperature difference or time temperature difference ratio versus the, uh, the Horner time ratio, you should be able to get the data into two lines, two, two linear behavior that you can line fit with identical slopes. I would call this the thermal Horner plot. Yeah, the, in the Horner plot that we have in pressure transient, um, we only have one graph, one, one, one line. Yeah, one, we line fit only one set of data. Here you have two. Why we have two? Because we need to know which part of the data should be line fitted and we should, which part should not. Anyway, once we get the slope, um, yeah, so uh, remember that early time is not necessarily line fitable. So you get the slope magnitude, you get the injection rate per layer. Also from the log derivatives intercept, you can get the geothermal temperature. And the thermal product extent is calculated by this equation. Um, this is application to two layers. So we have two set of data, we have two graphs, we find two betas, we calculate their rate, which is, you see, a close agreement with the actual rates which has been used to generate the synthetic data, which we use uh, for in, in numerical simulations. This is application for nine layers. Again, very good agreement. <clears throat> However, things are not that easy as always. When we get the layers very thin, then the heat exchange with the surrounding becomes so important and our assumption of neglecting the heat exchange with the surrounding is no longer valid and our model does not work, nor our graphical technique. Yeah, so what we have to, we have to come up with another way and um, it's not that easy, unfortunately. I mean, it, it, it is, it is uh, uh, the modeling is not necessarily easy. The, 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 we, you, you hope they end up to an easy graphical technique. In this case, it wasn't, it wasn't that way. Um, what we found that <clears throat> when you add the heat exchange with the surrounding, the resulting <coughs> Governing equations are no longer coupled. For every layer, you have coupling with the other neighboring layers. And uh, that makes uh, the system of PDEs coupled, not decoupled. And that coupling um, causes the solution to be very complex, involving inversion of an uh, eigenvalue problem a solution from uh, the Henkel uh, domain. The solution is programmed and can be obtained for any number of layers, but it is no longer as simple as it was. For the three layers, I'm showing the solution here. You have this term, this term, this term should be plotted versus the, the Horner time ratio and obtained, uh, should be line fitted in order to, get, to obtain the property. So that was for conventional reservoirs. We are still working on that, uh, but we are also started working on, on conventionals uh, in order to use the same thing. Uh, so in the shale wells, uh, a lot of wells are actually uh, implemented, um, have this uh, fiber optic implemented, and um, um, uh, some of these problems are actually, uh, I, I work with the industry to, to develop them. So I, I know that uh, these, these, these are what, what they are looking for. Uh, first one is, to, do, to, to use the temperature warm back. So after you hydraulic frag the well, you will have warm back of, uh, at the location of the fractures, you, you injected the stimulation fluid, which is cooler than the reservoir, and um, you have this warm back temperature. From the warm back temperature, we try to find the geometry of the fracture, something that uh, very little has been done on it, to find how far, the, what is the half length of the fracture, the length of the fracture, and also what is the width of the fracture. That's the geometry. We want to find the dimensions of the fracture. The method that we came up with is, um, we solved this um, analytically and we came up, this was the easiest way to give the solution. It is type curves. So the type curves uh, are in uh, 
in the logarithmic derivative as well as the primary derivative and you are supposed to get your data matched with one of these type curves and then use these equations in order to get the width of the fracture, the half length of the fracture and the geothermal gradient. Application to one example case is here. Um, so this is the data being fitted with the type curves and uh, these are the properties that has been obtained from matching the type curves. We came up with uh, also an asymptotic solution that allows a late time graphical uh, uh, linear straight line uh, uh, fitting. That is also shown here. It can work, but then you have to identify when you can line fit your data. Following the hydraulic fracturing, once you are done with hydraulic fracturing, then you go with uh, um, you flow back. You flow back in order to produce your uh, simulation fluid. <coughs> During the flat, flow, that flow back, you have this opportunity to use the thermal production logging to obtain the per fracture contribution. You want to know how much each of these fracture stages or, or clusters, how much is, con that's, that's loosely called production logging today in, in the unconventionals. But that production logging is all about contribution per, per fracture. How is it done? You have two equations. Um, one is the energy balance, one is the mass balance. You know the mass the, uh, downstream, mass upstream is unknown, mass fracture is unknown, that's what you're looking for. This is the important one, huh? You have, you have um, temperature along the wellbore, so you have T upstream, T downstream. However, you don't have the fracture entry temperature. That's the missing point. You have two, two equations, three unknowns. The problem is underdetermined. You cannot solve it. What you have to do in order to find the solution is to find the temperature, the entry temperature of the fracture, which was the goal of this work. So what we did was to look at the shot in period during the flow back and try to come up with a way to estimate that entry temperature of the fracture. Um, in fact, if the fluid became, it could have become completely stopped, I mean completely static, we, we did not need any um, technique uh, to estimate it because eventually the temperature at the well would have become the temperature at the entry of the fracture. The problem is, even during the shot in period, the fractures are still communicating. Fluid is not static in the well, it's still dynamic. So the question is, how, in, given that dynamic nature, <clears throat> how we can find um, the temperature, uh, uh, the entry temperature of the fracture? We came up with this model. So close to the fracture, far from the fracture, we, we separated the data, the data close to the fracture, far from the fracture, the non-fractured zone, which is shown by red, is given by this equation. So you plot this data, you get the parameters in this, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but you get the parameters in this term, then you plug them in the difference between the two, which is shown by the green here, and you find the inflow temperature of the fracture. That's the inflow temperature. So then you can plug it back into this equation and you find the mass of the fracture as the, the mass, per, the contribution per fracture, that's the flow. With that, I'm done with the presentation. I'm gonna, uh, I'm thanking the uh, um, funding from the uh, Carbon Safe Project of the uh, Department of Energy, uh, National Energy Technology Lab, CCARB Offshore Partnership. Uh, we are working with them on the offshore, uh, CCOS in Louisiana, Louisiana Board of Regent uh, RCS Award, and it is used uh, Chevron Innovative Research Support. Uh, for the funding over these past years. Thank you for listening, and the floor is open for questions. Okay.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Sure. Very nice presentation. Um, in the first part, you said you had modeled um, the distribution of CO2, um, and you saw that it wasn't going radially, it was going upwards. Because you had um, maps um, that showed you like the time scale of what was going on. But then when you did the CO2 plane modeling, you assumed a radial distribution. So, Excellent question. <laughs> Let me see if I can find the Come on. You are right. In those examples, I just did the third really nicely shape uh, because I didn't have time to show you more examples, but that paper has a uh, Many papers, many examples with heterogeneity and also with anisotropy. What you see here is uh, is uh, uh, more of uh, of heterogeneity, but anisotropy meaning that it goes in one direction mostly than the other one, and yeah, it gives uh, reliable answers those ways too. So another follow-up oh, question yes. that was on. Um, so since you, you remember you showed that illustration that you showed the plume growing upwards, um, if you use multiple worlds, do you do the injection at different heights or? Excellent question. What do you? Uh, I yes, mean, you should. Absolutely. So that you can yeah. map it. Did, did the scope of your project allow you to do that or see how you can map the steel to plume boundary by multiple injection points from different wells or? I assume I'm, I'm yeah, so let me let me explain on the picture because I think it may not be very clear. But uh, the goal is to to look at each of these separately. Probably you start with the shallowest and you run the test in the shallowest because you, you are more concerned with get shallower, right? I mean, uh, it really, it's, it's a choice of an operator, but you, you should do it per layer as you pointed out. Yes, you have to do it per layer. Uh, but per layer, it should, uh, I'm, I'm doing it per layer. Yeah, for every layer, I do it separately. You, uh, if you, for instance, it's not that it is not applicable for multiple layers. It should be applicable for multiple layers as well. Um, but then you obtain an average. Um, we, we, if, if you, for instance, um, use it for two layers which are separated by a shale layer, for instance, two layers, uh, again, it gives you the answer, but uh, you may think that um, this is the average, right? This would be the average, because in one of them it may, may be ahead of the other one. It is not very useful uh, in that sense. Yeah. Yes, Michael. Can you talk a little bit about injectivity issues? So assuming what you are injecting into is close volume, eventually the pressure is going to go up and then you will need more and more pressure on the surface to go in. How would you address that? I mean, the field. Same question. You, you are mostly bounded by, for the injectivity of the CO2, you are mostly bounded by what? What, what is it the limit? You want to inject as much as you want, right? As much as possible, because sometimes um, the CO2 is coming and you need to accommodate it. But are you able to inject at any amount you like? Exactly. So. The, the limitation is coming because of the fractional pressure, right? You, you have uh, pressure that you, you don't want to jeopardize, your, jeopardize, the, 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 jeopardize the, uh, the cap rock integrity as well as the well integrity. So you don't want to exceed uh, a certain pressure, fractional pressure. And uh, with that in mind, um, that's the reason that we introduced the stack systems CCUS. Did you notice we not only inject in one layer but multiple layers because uh, that may not give us the injectivity that we need? Yeah. 
Yeah, Shell has been working on this extensively, and how they can maximize the uh, injectivity. So they, what they did was that, um, for at the beginning, they were seeing that um, they have this Quest project in Canada, but they were doing, um, they were injecting, and the feeling was that even the well is not fully accepting the CO2, um, meaning that. Well, only part of the perforations are, are accessible for the CO2. Some of it, which is this, this, this stadium aquifer, is not accessible for the CO2. Um, so they started injecting until they made the plume around the well, like a big plume around the well. Um, now you, you, you have no, much less resistance uh, for the CO2 to come because Think about the relative permeability of water, the wetting phase, compared to CO2, right? The relative permeability of water is a major, um, is the major, is playing the major role in not allowing the CO2 to come in. Yeah? When you have the <clears throat> CO2 coming in, then uh, making a big, making a big uh, plume around the world, then you have uh, no, not much of resistance anymore. Um, okay. um, a couple of more um, follow-up questions. Um, so you were able to estimate the saturation of CO2. Um, so is it the near well bore saturation or like the saturation in the entire reservoir? And in any case, how did you benchmark it? Like what gives you confidence that this, have you tried another method like maybe um, some data from um, Tracer or like single well near bore kind of modeling to see how close you are to the representative value for what you would call the saturation of CO2 injection? Um, so I think, yes, if, let, let me just rephrase what, what you say so I make sure that I understand what you say. Um, we have two pressure techniques, right? Which one do you, you are thinking about now? Because one was just sending a pulse and a right round of the pulse. The other, was was just send the just do the pressure test, do the follow-up test, do whatever. Do just inject or produce and watch the pressure arrival. Watch the watch when you hit the wall. So it's like this: the pressure travels, it travels, it travels, it travels, and hit this wall, right? In fact, it's not a wall; it's a balloon because it's a CO two, right? It's, it hits a balloon, and suddenly it feels it because it goes down. That's that's the uh, Derivative, right? Okay. Which one? You, which one you mean? Um, so it was the one in the second one. See, in the second one, it cannot. Um, the issue is not about saturation. The issue is whether we find the edge of the plume or not. That's the question. You want to find the edge of the plume. Basically. <clears throat> If you have bloom which is not going in a very in that nice uh, textbook radial form, is going in one direction. You have you are going to place you may be you you are the reservoir engineer of that project. You are going to say let's place at least two wells. One knowing that I'm just in this field, I'm going to place one in this direction and one in that direction, right? So. Let's say that this is the this is the well where the CO2 is being ejected, yeah. And you know that uh, this kx and ky are in this direction, and this direction. You are going to place one well in that direction, one well there, okay? Yeah. You are going to place two wells at least. Um, I guess it kind of depends on the field development strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I guess a lot of other factors like um, how. What, what is the permeability? What, you might have the direction of permeabilities, but you want to know how conductive the CO2 is. If, like you demonstrated, there's a fault in between, where it's just like a very nice sheet of uniform um, shell or uniform sand. But I guess based on what you the very nice simulations, I just wanted to know, was there any other method you used to kind of But what I told you was exactly what's being done in, in what has been done in one of the projects since now. Oh, okay. That they injected 
and they had two observations. Right, okay. They did not do my test, but the test that I'm proposing here is that if you do it, um, you get um, you get the arrival time right. in these two wells, and you should be able to get where the fall, where the where the CO two is. Uh, yes, Dr. Kim. Um, I feel like um, I should add also ask a question. I mean, if you have more questions from Professor Rebel, I mean, probably you could be. Uh, I feel like lonely. Um, every model um, has an assumption or many assumptions, and this is really a nice, of piece, a nice piece of work, um, especially someone who loves math and comes with analytical solutions. Uh, multiple partial differential equations coupled it together, pressure, temperature involved, all those sorts of things. Um, and one thing uh, that may uh, make your solution deviating significantly, as far as I see, is basically phase behavior of CO2 with, uh, let's say, other uh, fluids uh, or, uh, let's say, mineral components around. So, for, uh, one example, um, so oftentimes uh, I come up with the example of CO2 coming out of a uh, soft drink. So, you know, if you open a Sprite can, and you can see uh, lots of bubbles are coming out. And then if you pressurize it, then you can basically dissolve significant amount of uh, CO2 into water, and into oil, and those sorts of things. In other words, the way that I'm thinking is that that kind of chemical reaction is actually happening very quickly. Uh, and then your CO2, uh, that's the interaction with rock mineral, that takes actually a long time. So that's probably less, uh, let's say, worried, but again, Fluid to fluid interaction, sure. especially CO2. Dissolution in water. Right, yeah, so uh, uh, dissolved in water. Sure. That's probably a very important aspect. Sure. And how would you put that um, aspect into your uh, mind? I'm just curious. Excellent question. Yeah, um, we have to always remember one great point that has been mentioned. All these equations, so I. I answered in two, two steps. All these equations have assumptions. And these assumptions sometimes are very limiting. For instance, this very test that I'm talking about right now, there is a big limitation to it. What is it? Let's look at the equation. Here, I assume that the relative permittivities are given. Yeah? I have to, otherwise I cannot plot this graph. Here, in this test, I assume eta is given. I don't have the divisivity coefficient unless I do a three interference testing. I cannot do this with only single well. I must have done something before so I know eta. Yeah, well, when I say um, whenever we propose a technique, we always, like in, uh, in well testing, we say that we know we find permeability. But do we find permeability? We find KH over mu, right? We find a group. So basically, um, we need assumptions. Um, those assumptions, you know, if I am in the field and I run two tests like this one, see, I have one well here and one well up there. The eta should be the same for both of them. I shouldn't be. So what I'm thinking now is relative distance. How far is it? How, how fast the CO2 is going this way compared to that way? I have to use these cleverly. I cannot say that these are, these are definitely usable right now. It's not that way. So that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> CO2 dissolution in brine is very important. We have at least around two mole percent, uh, two percent mole fraction, uh, yeah, 0 0.02 mole fraction of uh, CO2 dissolution in the brine. So for my friend who is now looking at the, his cell phone, what is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think is gonna happen for the CO2 when it dissolves in the brine? What, what happens for the pressure? I don't you, put you in the spot, but uh, Someone volunteer to say what happens for the pressure? Goes huh? Goes Excellent. Yes. It goes down. Why? Because 
the high compressibility fluid is disappearing, right? Mm -hmm. The pressure should go. So all my pressure tests should have been some, there should be some influence by the CO2 distribution, which I'm not including. I assume that is negligible. Yeah? And still, so that's very clear. And second <coughs> question that I have got in mind with that is, by any chance, are you dealing with the CO2 as a gas phase and supercritical phase at the same time in a certain field? Or CO2 is always gas or CO2 is always supercritical? That's sort of an assumption that in this know. case, it's always supercritical. Yeah, we go below 800 meters and we assume is. Um, what that implies is that phase behavior is become even more significant issue. Especially in the well bore, as we go from the surface to the well, to to the uh, to the bottom bore, yeah, we may have phase change. Thanks. Okay. Yes, uh, more stuff. Sure. This one. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, we characterize the fault conductivity in three directions with a single point, and this model is really fast to calculate the pressure of a single point. And the uh, pressure, yeah. 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 But uh, when it comes to leakage rate, uh, sure. Model, uh, model leakage rate, Absolutely. This model is able to calculate the pressure uh, in the fault zone in the three dimensions for the infinite point. In order to calculate the leakages, we need the pressure in infinite number of points. Sure. So this is the a speed problem. That's correct. But uh, in my opinion, I never considered the speed as an advantage of this uh, characterization method. The two main advantages of this characterization method is first, we characterize the fault conductivity just by a single point that's the active well that we inject it with. And the second advantage is the uniqueness of the estimated fault conductivity. Yeah, well done, Mustafa. You've done it. That's right. Hopefully, we can overcome this uh, rate calculation too, because we, we cannot do this like uh, with infinite points. That shouldn't be the path. Yeah, that way is not effective. We know that. Yes, Dr. Waltrich. I have a simple question. Well, uh, actually, two. One, so out of my curiosity, and another one's uh, maybe it's more technical question. But in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that uh, the cost of CO2 sequestration for industrial, I, I, I kept, I keep thinking about that, and I don't, I cannot explain why the cost is so different between. Uh, I think the two comparisons you show it is transportation or industrial. Right at the beginning, you show like a pie chart. Sure. Uh, I'd just like to hear from your opinion or your guess, if you know that, why is that different? Because right at the beginning, when you show the different... My reference is this graph. It's the Global CCS Institute. Excellent question, uh, but I do not have the good answer for it. Not my expertise. Okay. Yeah, because I was just curious because I think right at the beginning you showed that the, in, in the industrial environment mm -hmm. it's, it's cheaper. Yeah, here it's shown. Right. Yeah. While what was the other type of the environment that you mentioned? Electrical power generation. Electrical. Like coal yeah. power plant. Yeah, and the way that I was thinking is like industrial, okay, I could be thinking like you can design additional equipment that could help you to make it cheaper. The electrical power plant, you could do essentially the same thing. So, I honestly, in these chemical plants, all you need to do is just to add. You, you don't do anything. Diaper, the CO2 yeah. is coming like with perfect, yeah, high purity, oh, no nitrogen, point. nothing, just maybe dry, captured, yeah. just just transported, and uh, that will of course cost, right? Because you have to you have to do something. Yeah, right. But uh, yeah, I, I, sometimes it's not really any, when we talk about capture, it's not like going to uh, design a um, um, oxy right. fuel, blah, 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 blah. I, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> expressing those, but yeah, right, it's, right. It's, it's, it's not a, a, another path. Right. 
Right. I was just curious. My second question is when you show that, I think you stay on that slide for a while, you show a very nice high resolution, uh, <clears throat> I guess, migration of the CO2. Slightly? Yeah, in a 4D seismic. Or sure, sure. I was wondering if that's available. Uh, why people don't just do that all the, most of the time? For the seismic? Yeah. Excellent it's question. Really expensive or it takes too long or it's yeah. not always you can do that. When you compare it to pressure, is of course. Uh, My point is like, much, I would uh, compare that technique to your technique. Yeah. That one seems to be way more resolution, gives more information. Yeah, this one. Why uh, don't you use these all the time and then use your model? Mm -hmm. I think I know the answer, but I don't, I, I'm not sure. So that's what I'm asking. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not a seismic person. I know some of the limitations of the seismic. It is costly if you want to do it uh, in an offshore environment. This one especially is offshore. Uh, you know, they acquire the data acquisition. So, and then processing and the interpretation is costly. Um, and also the resolution, if you want to, as you go deeper, it gets Less and less, and sometimes it's, it's 20 meters of uh, like tens of meters of resolution. So, you know, but I, I of course, we have, don't have a seismic persons to, to defend seismic. So, 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 let me just say I don't know about seismic. All I know is the pressure trans transient testing, and I think uh, pressure is very low cost, and uh, you can run it several times whenever you want, if you have the well gauge, if you have the pressure gauge down there. But you have to drill well, right? True. Yeah, you have an observation well uh, in this, um, somewhere. You have to have an observation. Yeah, again, I'm just trying to compare the two for, for my own understanding. So, sure. Then maybe, yeah, I would ask you then later about your answer, but <laughs> whether this was a satisfactory answer or not. It's fine. It's here now. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you would share that with you. No, I don't know the answer. That's what I'm uh, asking. I, I okay. No okay, my friends. Uh, please, a big question. Oh, I'm going to get the present too? That's <laughs> not fair. I'm a. Two cameramans. So, uh, that's why he asked a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's get back Thanks, my friends. Enjoy. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Because they thank you.